Thanks for taking the time. Appreciate it. No, it's okay. It's okay. You know, I, I, I hope I can. I hope I can give you some some information that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, might be I mean, interesting. I have you on so many records, you know. So I, I said, like, okay, shit. Uh, and I spoke to so many guys you played with. So I'll, I'll drop a lot. Oh. Oh. And uh, but uh, I'll just jump in by asking you. You, you know, I, I just listened today to some new ones. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 You know, and uh, otherwise, have you been pre preparing something new as a band leader also lately, the last two, three years uh, since that one? That, no, no, uh, no, that was the last thing. That was the last thing I did uh, mm. in terms of myself. I mean, I've stopped playing. I've retired now. Yeah. I've retired uh, in, in, the, in the end before Christmas. Oh, so uh, okay. so we want to spend more time down here. And I've got a bit of arthritis in my finger hand in my thumb and various bits and pieces but yeah. now the only other recording thing i've done recently is my grandfather who died in 1942 was a a composer whose and his work was very neglected mm. and um i've um it's a, a piano for piano and violin and i've managed to uh get that recorded which has been it's something he did when he was at the, the beginning of the last century Oh. And it was never recorded. It was one or two of them were played, but never recorded. So mm -hmm. I thought, right, I'll, I'll correct that. And so I, I, I got it recorded, and it's fantastic. So it's called uh, "The Music of, of Frederick Lawrence." Is my grand my my grandfather, who I never knew, but um, mm. but he was a fantastic composer, and and he uh, he later on uh, because he because you know when you're composing, you need to earn money. And so he ended up working for a publishing company and then working for EMI as a researcher and, and various other things and organising orchestras like the mm. London Philharmonic and uh, Covent Garden and things like that. So his time was taken up with that. So his his compositions, a lot of them were sort of in, in boxes. So we oh, anyway, oh. so anyway, that's 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 out now, which is my la la my latest production. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to an executive it. producer. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. I'll yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I think the last couple of things I did, the Kenny thing was a similar situation because he gave me that music yeah. a long time ago. And uh, well, he says it on the sleeve notes, doesn't he? Yeah. But, uh, and, I, and I just thought it was, it was playing on my conscience. So I thought, right, we better do something with this. And, um, so with the help of Pete Churchill uh, and and um, and uh, we we managed to do it even during the COVID thing. So we had to do certain things separately, which is a bit tricky. But we did it, you know. And oh, it sounds, sounds like beautiful. we're all there at the same time. Yeah, it sounds beautiful. So, uh, yeah. So uh, no, that was a worthwhile thing. It's only short. It's only, but it fits. It fits onto a a sort of a, a, a vinyl disc, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, as long as you remember to put it played at the right speed, because it's uh, it's forty five. A lot of LPs are seventy eight. Yeah. I mean, are thirty three and a third. Yeah. But this is so. When I first got the pressing, I I, I put it on and I thought it sounds very deep. It was very extremely deep. And I thought, and then I rang up the guy and I said, "What's happened to the pressing?" He said, "Listen, you you're obviously playing at the wrong half the speed." Because I, I thought I thought it was, anyway. So I changed the belt on the turntable. And then it was crystal clear, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Chris, what was your story with, with, with? I mean, obviously, I just listened this week a little bit. I mean, Kenny has been one of my biggest heroes as a composer, and you know, yeah, yeah. Often. And I know you had like a really long musical and personal relationship. I mean, as friends, you know. Yeah. And yeah. Like, uh, what, what? What? How did your story begin, actually? And what with him, with Kenny? Yeah. What I think. Well, I, I mean, I, I started playing with John Taylor in uh, when I was about seventeen. Oh wow! Okay. Time ago, and um, and then and then uh, sort of John Taylor had a sextet with Chris Pine and Stan Saltzman and Tony Levin, and and Kenny was part of that sextet. So I um, that's when I started playing. That's when I started playing with him a bit more because I was a 
because I was a reader. <laughs> yeah. And I, could, and I could do, you know, I was a bit more, um, I had uh, a wider variety of things that I could do. He liked, he liked to write some more slightly adventurous bass parts and things that he knew had to be, I'm not putting it, I mean, it had to be sort of in tune, otherwise it, the harmonies didn't work. So, and that's what I could, well, I tried, I did my best to do. So uh, that's how I met Kenny. And then, and then played with him with uh, in, with John Taylor and Adam Nussbaum. Yeah. We did a few tours and uh, yeah, and so I sort of, and I sort of played with him for on and off for years and years and years, you know. And uh, he was a lovely guy and very extremely self-effacing and uh, yeah. highly talented, highly motivated, and um, yeah, and like me, he did all sorts of. He played on all like you know TV shows or film music and commercial music to make a you know to make a a living so we bump into each other doing things in that respect as well which were slightly uh different to what we really wanted to do but that's yeah. that's how you earn your living being a professional freelance musician yeah exactly D did you guys ever talk about composition i mean you know obviously because he's written not, so much I'm music not, yeah i'm not a composer but I, I mean i don't compose anything apart from I, I write the occasional checks and uh, <laughs> and trying to keep my accounts up to scratch, but I'm not a writer. But I mean, Kenny was Kenny was prolific. He, he mm. just he'd he'd hand out bits of music. Some uh, he, I've still got lots of his original things he's written. I've still you know original mm. handwritten pieces. Wow, and yeah. then along came the fax machine, and then it meant he could with a fax machine he could copy me, give you a, a sheet on that awful flimsy paper there uh, and. And then eventually it, it developed the it could use a you know proper printing machine and uh so everybody's got some of his music everybody's got because when he came to play with you he always had all the he was one of the most organized musicians mm. because he always turned up with his library of stuff so there's no confusion and he, mm. his chords would all be written out as he he, he would wouldn't put key signatures on music it would be an open key and then he would always put in the accidentals and things you know yeah. remarkable really and so yeah. and there was no the voicings of a chord would have every single note in the chord where he wanted them to be spaced out what was at the bottom what was at the top what certainly what was in the middle and that was his thing this is how i want it to sound but he yeah. wasn't dogmatic about it but that's what he wanted so that's what he did you know yeah interesting yeah well uh, oh sorry yeah. Come on. Oh, the cat, oh, cat just going fast. <laughs> that's yeah. the one thing. That's the one thing my wife misses is our cat, which is in London. So oh. see that. Cat. Yeah, he, he, he's just showing <laughs> off here, yeah, like he's, he, I have like you know treats there. So he's like, oh wait a second, man. I, oh, I see. Oh right. Oh. He's like begging me now. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, Chris, you, you mentioned you started playing with with John Taylor in the in the late sixties. How, how was it for you, like? You know, I, I checked some records that I have you on it, like with Alan Skidmore and Mike Westbrook, and yeah, you. I, I think you're on everyone's records in the beginning of the '70s. Like, uh, how how was the scene back then? How was it? Well, it was. I mean, I, mean, I felt so creative, met, like at least that early '70s period. It, it was. It was. Yeah, uh, I think people. Um, when I first I first met John Taylor, there used to be a um, a pub in near to Wembley Stadium, the, the famous football stadium. And um, and uh, he's obviously a cool cat. <laughs> yes. And um, next to Wem near to Wembley Stadium, called the Hop Vine, and there was a guy there, Tommy Whittle, who was a great saxophone player, who used to work for uh, one of the TV companies. But he was a great player, and his thing was every week was to have a jazz club in this pub, and so therefore we'd have a, a rhythm section with different people, and that's where I first met John. I turned mm -hmm. up there to play, and John was there to play. Mm. And John Dankworth would come along and play various people, and um, and that's how that's how we sort of met. And then and then I did a few, you know, we sort of encountered each other in other situations. And then we we did a trio record in Germany with me and him and Tony yeah. Levin. And um, yeah, and then we we sort of he was he was one of my great one of my greatest friends. Really, we were very we were very shocked when he. When he keeled over, you know, which yeah. was terrible, you know, he, he didn't really take care of him. You know, he was he he, he could have actually avoided that what happened to him if he'd been taking the right medication. But he was always so, uh, you know, 
oh, I haven't got time for that sort of thing, you know. So, but anyway, that's that's life. But he was uh, no, he was always a great influence on me. He was very always very patient with me mm. whenever we worked with anybody. Um, he'd always sort of uh, if for something I didn't know, he'd always write me out a chord chart. So we were talking from the same the same script, and um, and uh, he became yeah, he was uh, just a an amazing friend and a, an amazing musician. And now people are just. <clears throat> realizing what um how brilliant he actually was and then i was talking with this a student at the guild hall who's the other day i did an interview on zoom and he was asking about certain bits about john taylor and a lot of people don't know a lot of things about him and uh, so i filled him in and one of the most important things was a, a piece that john taylor wrote for himself and for stan saltzman and they recorded it in north germany and it was a piece John wrote with full orchestra, full symphony orchestra. Oh, really? Jazz piano and and um, and saxophone. And saxophone, flute, tenor, uh, tenor, uh, soprano and flute. And uh, this recording with this orchestra, it's a live recording. I'm trying to, at the moment, we're going to try and find out how we can put it out there oh, on the Jazz in Britain label. Yeah. Because it's the writing of it is I, when I sent it to this a copy of it to this student it, it sort of blew his mind <laughs> because it's so it's so good and that was over twenty years ago they they recorded that and it's so that's the it's the it's one of the finest uh, bits of um, music that combines the two elements of mm -hmm. classical music with improvisation and written by a jazz pianist who'd never written for an orchestra before he just he learned it all himself. And wrote it all out by hand, and and the, but the music, everything, French horns, harps, uh, you know, the whole woodwind section, trumpets, yeah. I mean, everything. It's just incredible music, and uh, so and it's just got this one recording which I managed to transfer from a cassette. Oh, that would be amazing, yeah. Yeah. To uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, we're going to work on that. I've been talking to Stan about it, so uh, so he's happy for that to something to happen to that. But of course, you have to work out the complexities of. Uh, nor Deutsche Rundfunk, I suppose, and to get permission. But I mean, I'm sure if there was a, a nice, I don't know. Anyway, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, it will be uh, great. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. And then there's the one thing came out with we did a group we had with John the Sextet with a record called Fragment, which has just come yep. out again. You know, that was on the a label that was um, uh, built by um, Gordon Beck. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Piano player. Piano player, sir. Yeah, I know. Absolutely yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He, he yeah. just, he, he had this own, he's a Jaguar, Jaguar Records, and they would just, he just made cassettes. And so that's so that that that, that um, fragment was made on a cassette and uh, copied. And it sounds sounds pretty good considering, you know, if you get it, yeah. if you get it tuned up properly, it's, uh, it, it's better to hear the music slightly less quality yeah. rather than. Really good quality with crap music. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I absolutely. You know. agree. <laughs> so you've got a black cat on your cap there. That's we've got a black cat. Yeah. Oh, is it oh no. Oh wow. Yeah, oh, I mean, just like our cat. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, our, our, our cat. He's a Russian blue, you know. So it, he's. All uh, oh, right. Yeah, Special. It, yeah, he's he's so smart, man. It's like it's crazy because. He knows all the tricks and how to manipulate you and everything. Like I, I like, like every cat more or less. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Of course. Where, where are you? Where are you talking from? Where are you? I'm in Slovenia, in Maribor. Oh, you? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Ah, Slovenia. Okay. Yeah. Um, you probably played well, Ljubljana, I guess. I played in Ljubljana, but I mean, I played in Ljubljana when it was still Yugoslavia, communist. Right? Yeah, yeah. When it was communist, uh, with because um, Henry Lauder, trumpet player, yeah, Henry Lauder. his first, his second wife rather, um, uh, was was from Ljubljana. Oh yeah, Henry told me about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I played, and I played, and I did some. We did a Beethoven sextet uh, with a small ensemble. We went over there, so I went and uh, had uh, some uh, slivovitz and and some bread and some sausage with Henry's. Mother-in-law and father-in-law who made the <laughs> sliver bits from the the tree in his garden. So it's like, yeah. Exactly. So I've been, I've been, I was there, but when it was communist, so it was quite, yeah, yeah very different now, of course. Oh, now it's amazing. I mean, it's yeah, like, of course, yeah. Know, it's no, a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful place. Now people yeah. will, 
visit and you know come in and out it's great yeah yeah it's it's uh, i like it here it's calm which is nice and the quality of life it's it's it you know it's better where are than... you from where are you from are you from slovenia yeah, slovenia. yeah, yeah. sure sure yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 great yeah. well it's very nice let's yeah. keep it all nice and peaceful <laughs> yeah i like that i like that yeah. you know with all the chaos in the world we need you need yeah. some peace so but yeah uh but uh yeah uh Another question, Chris, is like, uh, I saw then that, it, you know, besides jazz, you, where you played with everyone, basically, on the UK. Yeah, lots of people, yeah. Yeah, like, how did you then enter slowly this pop and rock world where you also basically played with everyone? Almost? <laughs> like, well, I played with lots, of, lots of different people. Well, I, well when you're, uh, I mean, I, um, when, I was, when I was a kid, um, I went to music college and I played the piano, not very well, but I got into music college. And then they said, when I was about 13, they said, you have to pay, take up a second instrument. And I didn't know, I hadn't thought about that. And I said, and they said, we need bass players. We don't have any bass players. So I said, okay, well, I'll play the bass. And my, fa my father, Tony Lawrence, was a fantastic pianist, jazz pianist. Mm. And he could play, he, he, his father was the great composer. My dad was a rebel and he became a jazz musician and he could play every tune in any key mm. which i've never managed to do but he, he could do it and um and so and, I, and so I, I always had that thing of playing and when in those days if you had a double bass people went oh and they'd ring you up and say oh you you own an instrument that means would you like to come and play even though i was playing classical music would you like to come and play some jazz i went yeah all right and then so that's how i've always had a parallel parallel situation where i've always played both kinds of music at sort of at the same time. And I was very fortunate to play good music with some great people, you know? Um, yeah. Very lucky. Yeah. Very lucky. So that's, that's my, that's, I've always, I've always said, uh, yeah, in those days, but now everybody's, there are millions of bass players and it's, uh, there's so many musicians in the world. Now it's almost it's crazy, overdosed. It? <laughs> yeah. yeah, True. Actually. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but but those uh, you know the, the things with you know Peter Gabriel and Stink and Phil Collins and all these guys, these were mostly studios studio sessions that you did or yeah studio things yeah yeah okay. yeah yeah they just I never did, I never sort of I went on the road with Peter Gabriel with um, um, with an orchestra ah oh, okay so we, it was it was called the uh, the Blood um, oh yeah that project yeah. Yeah, that project, which was which was really good fun. We went to different parts of the world with him, and he's a really cool, he's a really nice, caring guy, and uh, we were looked after very well. And he took a proper orchestra, and we went all over the place. Yeah, it was very right. good. It's America, South America, wow. uh, yeah, everywhere except Australia, but but, um, mm -hmm. but it was great. It was really good, really nice, and that's so that. So I've always done all those. Because I can do lots of different things, not not always terribly well, but I can do them, get away with it, and um, so it's um, yeah. So people think they think, oh, you if you you become useful to them, so therefore uh, that's what you have to do. You have to be jack of all trades and yeah. try and be master of some of them. But <laughs> um, yeah, but so it's been. I've been very. I've been very lucky to have been you know, and then work with the Academy of St Martin in the Fields. For a long time over the years uh with neville mariner um yeah which is yeah, been an amazing yeah an amazing thing and then people wonder how you have you did you start off doing this or, but I, everything started about the same time so you know different seeds in the same pot really i suppose mm, interesting yeah <laughs> yeah well, when did you start touring actually i mean the, the, uh, going out from the uk when was that for you well, that would have been. Well, we did a few tours with a guy called John Warren mm -hmm. and John Sermon. We did. Yeah. Uh, we had a brass project and we had a big band thing, which John Taylor played in as well. And we'd go around, play around Europe a bit, mm. and um, yeah, and odd odd projects like going to Germany and then playing when that Swiss guy who um, had the uh, in Bar was it Basel or Bern Basel who had that. He would get a lot of people from all over Europe to put them all together. People from America, Hannibal, that trumpet player, I remember. Oh, Hannibal Peterson, yeah. Yeah, he and he came and he put, we were all put together and said, right, get on with it, sort of thing. And we came up with some nice, yeah, worked with some really nice people. One off occasion, 
Ben, I can't, oh, I can't remember his name now. They can't fight. Be, Be, Berent, Joachim, no, Berent, who it was, uh, he started the first, he organized the first jazz festival in, in Poland. Mm, okay. When it was still communist, which, which helped because this, the, 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 the communist regime, they didn't know about jazz was a, the only free thing that could happen in, in a, in a communist country because they didn't, they couldn't pigeonhole it because it was, yeah. and the people played a lot of free jazz and loads of free jazz in, and they thought they didn't know that if it was right or wrong or it's, it was great. Yeah. It was a great, uh, it was quite uh, un, an underground of, of uh, democracy in a funny sort of way in a communist situation. Yeah. <laughs> in Poland, yeah, you had. I mean, you know, Komeda and Krzysztof Stanko. Uh, I mean, Tomasz Stanko and all those guys. Yeah, like, amazing. yeah, 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 amazing. And they yeah. they thrived. They thrived yeah. in, in that communist situation. And they were allowed to go abroad and come back, and providing they came back, of course. Yeah. But uh, and they did all right out of that situation. You yeah. know, not yeah. many people did. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You mentioned your father was was a piano player. Uh, when did you? How did you discover? That your love for jazz also. When did that happen? Did you hear some artists or records or? Well, my dad, my dad played and my dad played with some really good. Uh, he played in nightclubs. That was his thing, to uh, you know. And he played with. Uh, he had a, a trio with um, uh, David Williams, who uh, the bass player. Mm -hmm. When Dave, when he was living in in in, in London, and uh, they had a trio, and he also played with uh, um, the guy that worked with. Um, Stevie Wonder doing his uh, God, can't remember his name, but he, anyway, but he was a bass player who worked with Stevie Wonder doing uh, who, who did a lot of his uh, synthesizer stuff. Oh shit! No. He was a South African bass player. South anyway, but South um, I can't remember his name, but but he's still going. He's still going, and he's an expert in all that stuff. Uh -huh, and my dad okay. and he he played in this trio with my dad. And uh, but David Williams and my dad, they they had a trio with a, a, a West Indian drummer, and they used to come to our house. And my dad set up a recording studio in the garage, oh. in our garage, and he bought a lovely Yamaha piano, and he bought all the microphones, he bought oh. all the all the equipment, and uh, and he would do all these recordings. And I'd, I'd be in sort of there listening to all this, and I and my dad loved George Shearing and. Uh, and then I remember when I was about twelve or something. I I I, I heard uh, it was it was My, Miles mm. uh, Miles Davis and, and also obviously Oscar Peterson, Oscar Peterson with um, Shelley Man and um, guitar player. Um, oh, Herb Ellis, probably. Yeah. No, not Herb Ellis. Yeah, uh, no, Barney um, Kessel. Barney Kessel. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love that. That was fantastic yeah. for me. That was like. It was like so music. It was like jazz chamber music. That yeah, it's so good. It was so good. Ray Brown was incredible, and uh, and that was a real influence. And then and then I listened to uh, a Miles Davis piece called I think it was called Circle Circles on one of the albums. And I just mm -hmm. and the openness of that, the freedom. I just thought that really knocked me out with Ron Carter and Tony Williams. It was like wow. <laughs> and then and then I started playing a bit of some bit of people who wanted to play a bit of free music and stuff. So I went and played with them a bit, which was sort of all right, you know, and then and then I played and then did a few broadcasts with with John Taylor and a few other people. And then met Alan Skidmore and played yeah. with him. Elton Dean and also, then, right? I mean with yeah. Him. yeah. And then and then John Sermon, we had a we had a long relationship. Right and uh, and he's still we're still great friends today and um and uh, he's still one of my yeah great supporter i mean fantastic musician yeah. and uh sticks to his guns and mike westbrook another one but john yeah. taylor john um, warren all these yeah, yeah this Steve generation warren. was incredible yeah of yeah, the it was uk a, players there was, a lot, was a lot of stuff going on a lot of free music at the same time and kenny wheeler would get mixed up with all the he get mixed up with all the free music and some yeah. of the people in the studios used to say kenny why are you playing this stuff you know well, I say, you know, I, I say. and then whenever, whenever you listen to any of the really free things with Kenny playing on there with, you know, like Barry Guy and, yeah. and Howard Ryder, people like that, they're all, they're all smashing, you know, knocking, you know, it's like, you know, uh, you know, whatever. 
uh, lot. And then suddenly over the top, Kenny's playing yes. and he's somehow developing a melody out of all this it sort of, uh, in my impression, it was very chaotic. But he, there's him flying over the top like a, an incredible bird, you know, yeah. like an eagle over the top and making this beautiful music and using all his skills and his trumpet playing and the flugel and everything. Remarkable, absolutely remarkable. He's the only person that really did that who mm -hmm. could cover the whole spectrum of music, you know, everything. Amazing. And then he, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was a very exciting time. Everybody being together and, you know, there was a bit of rivalry going on. And and every week there'd be a, there was a radio program called Jazz, <clears throat> it's called Jazz Club, BBC Jazz Club, where you play, you end up playing with, all sorts of people, British jazz musicians, and you'd end up in a band. You'd play for half an hour, and then another band would play for half an hour, mm. and then you. And then sometimes you'd be in both bands, so you'd have to take the bass from one band to another band to play. <laughs> and uh, but you met all these different people you'd never play, would never play with otherwise. People like Ronnie Ross, uh, um, or oh, Stan Robinson, all, uh, all these different people, and you'd. Um, yeah, you play with them. You might only play with them a couple of times in your life, mm. but you play with them, and they play with you. So it was a really exciting. But those now, those sort of programs aren't there anymore. Yeah, but, exactly. but fortunately, some people have recorded them all, so they're they, they're sort of slowly creeping out. Some of the programs that were wor worthy of being put out there again, you know. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. No. Mm. Uh, interesting. Uh, just like yeah. you know, when when I spoke to Stan Salzman and Henry. Yeah, louder. They also they were like how blooming the scene was, you know, that uh, it was all disconnecting and so many things happening. Basically, you were like pioneers in a way because you were doing it. Well, we, were, well, we weren't pioneers in the sense that we were trying to do things. Things were happening and we were sucked in. You know, we were. Oh yeah, we were yeah, sucked, like that. Yeah. We were suddenly involved because it's um, yeah. uh, because you could well you, you you had you could play you had the, the right equipment you you, you were uh, and so you had a car a car for instance and then you'd end up with uh you know taking the people in if any bass player has to have a car so people go oh yeah. can you give me a lift or so, so and you'd end up with people it was a lovely member with a drummer called brian spring who's a bit of a character i haven't seen him for years now but he uh, he'd come in the car with me and with the double bass and all his drums and even the front seat, he would be underneath the dashboard next to me and he would um and he'd have his um uh, and and i'd see and i'd hear the click of his roll up cigarette and he'd, oh i'd God. see smoke coming out from under the dashboard that, that was brian like ridiculous you know but um yeah so a lot of and that's who's you know spent long journeys with people in not as long as people in america but you know relatively long oh, journeys yeah. with people that you'd never worked, never sat with before in a car, and then you talk about everything. Henry is the expert at talking. Yeah, yeah. you're never you're never going to sleep and driving with Henry because he's like he's the font of all knowledge. He's no he knows everything about the universe, music, everything. You know, it's yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> he's, a, he's a nice guy. Yeah. I like Henry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, Chris, how did New View happen? That record, which is you know basically your band leading debut how did, almost how, how did i what sorry say that again how, how did your record new view happen like uh, because oh, well i just well one, one of the reasons was because i um i thought i wanted to have a quartet because i played with so many other people and i wanted i mean frank ricotti was a great friend of mine with stan and um stan Saltzman. we played in the london news jazz orchestra mm -hmm all those years ago when we were in our teens. And um, and I thought, right, Frank, I played with Frank, and Frank's a very self-effacing guy who, who doesn't put himself out there and have a group of his own, even though we did have a quartet for a while. But it, um, And I just thought, no, he's, he's sort of wasting away and people don't hear him. And I, so I mm. just thought, I, I'm going to make a record. I had this idea that if you make a record, you can actually pay everybody pay for the record and then you get it off your tax so what could be better <laughs> than that you know so it's it's, so it's, a, it's a, a wonderful experience to do and you're you're actually you're paying your friends 
and you're getting the money back from the tax man. So because you're putting something back into your business, into what you do. And I think if more people did that, the world would be a better place. You know, uh, it would be more interesting things going on. But mm. uh, he, um, and I, that's why I thought with Frank, so we started that quartet and it, and John Paracelli is so, such yeah, a wonderful yeah. guitar player and wonderful man and, and Martin France equally so. Yeah. And we just got on. And then, and then we thought, oh, some, and I've always played, but I've certainly worked with Norma for years, Norma Winston. And, um, and John Paracelli said, I think Norma would like to be on. So I said, yeah, great. Okay. So we did a couple of Kenny thing and a, a Joni Mitchell thing. And Norma came and sang and she did sang beautifully. Yeah. So it was, yeah. it was, yeah, it was exciting to do. And then you'd get the record cover and then the record cover, my, my wife's cousin is an artist. So, and I got her to make, uh, she made the, a, a scroll of a double bass, the scroll of it, and put special, um, I got one from a friend of mine, and it's just the scroll, and, he, and she put this paper around it yeah. and uh, moulded it, and then you took, you took the scroll out and you just had the paper in the shape of a scroll and you did the same with the bridge, and then you shine a light through it, and that's, that was another thing. So I was in, in, in employing my sort of rel relatives to, to, who were artists to actually help with the record cover. Hmm. Like my like with the with the Kenny Wheeler record, yeah. uh, my 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 daughter's wife who just died recently, unfortunately, she did the cover. She did the cover for Kenny's record. She combined. Did she did it on a computer? That's her thing, and uh, so she joined two photographs together. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But she did it, and every and when you look at the music on the piano, of Kenny's that was Kenny's. Kenny's room in his house where he did all his composing mm. and you look every note on the music and it's exactly correct every note is exactly what was on the music and she my daughter-in-law actually did all that wow. perfectly yeah so and I think uh, but and his Kenny's son was very happy with the fact that we did that and it was so yeah because Kenny was dead by then but um yeah. but uh, anyway yeah so I've always liked to involve people i know and john thurlow with jazz in britain is such a yeah. a good man a non-profit sort of he just the next the money from one goes to pay for the next project which is which is fantastic you know yeah yeah amazing man yeah yeah Beautiful. super uh yeah. chris uh you did provide information <laughs> okay <laughs> so, but no i mean thanks for sharing some of these thoughts i appreciate it no it's a pleasure it's my pleasure really nice to hear you talk about this like yeah kind of puts it all together and uh, okay yeah beautiful well, i hope you well i hope you can make some sense of it i will i'll leave it like it's a, it was a nice uh yeah it's a, it's a chat intro. we're having a chat like we're in a car together for the first time exactly we're just talking about experiences and and the funny thing is, certain things come up, and other things don't come up. But but that's for another time. But it's I think it's nice to sort of um, it's a good way to do things. It's nice to talk, yeah, naturally. Yeah, yeah. I regret sometimes that when I was on tour with with some people, and like you know, I, I didn't ask them about touring and stuff. So th that's why I'm doing these interviews now. Like, I, yeah, I, yeah. I want info. So no, oh no. Yeah. So we had some, we had some interesting yeah. tours. I must say, yeah. Yeah. One of the worst one, one of the worst ones was we coming back from Germany with John Warren with a big band, and we got into a a Force Eleven, that almost like a hurricane. Yeah, and it took uh, twenty seven hours instead of twelve hours on a boat, and we we're all there on the boat together, trying to drink and keep our drinks on the table, and the boat was going all over the place. And Harry Beckett, who's now yeah. dead, Harry Beckett in his bunk, he actually went white. <laughs> he went. He, he was. He felt so ill. He actually went. Hey, he got sure. paler and paler. You know. But, uh, I met him, but anyway, great, great bloke. Uh, oh, yeah. There was, you know, there. Everyone was. There, everyone remembers those, those mad situations. You know. So uh, plenty of them, probably. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Chris, I'll, I'll leave you a nice uh, Friday morning. <laughs> Okay. Okay. In, well, that's very nice. In France, but it was nice chatting with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. We're coming back, coming back to London today. We're coming back tonight, oh, so okay. it's great. Totally it's very nice it. to talk to you. And, you too. Uh, if you're ever if people like you, sort of actually keeping 
people's interest going and, and find it. We're, we're, we're actual human. We are all human beings. Yeah. <laughs> and we, yeah. You know, and it's uh, fascinating. But jazz is a fascinating world. It's fascinating, you know. It is. Yeah, yeah. It's all about these stories and, you know, the heritage. And yeah. I, I think it's important to keep it going. So, okay. All right. Yeah. Well, cool. God bless you. Yeah. Yeah, you too. Bye. Thank you.